Parshas Chayesora. Good. <clears throat> so we learned that Avram went to sacrifice Yitzchak. <clears throat> that was last week. <clears throat> and now we're learning that Sora died. So what's the connection between them? Let's see. Is there a connection? Vayeyu chayi Sora, and there were the days of Sora, the life of Sora, which is strange because this is talking about after she died. The life of Sora, 100 years and 20 years and seven years. Those are the years of the life of Sora. Strange sentence, very strange sentence. First of all, it's repetitive very repetitive and there's a lot of seemingly extra words over here it could, should have said the life of Sora was what does it have to say and then it repeats again it says these are the the years of the life of Sora it repeats it again <clears throat> maybe we wouldn't forget it says in the beginning of the sentence these are the these are the, this is the life of Sora. And it says 120 and seven years. Yemei Chai Yisora says it again. What does it have to say it for? So let's see, let's have a look. Now we have to remember a very important thing. The Torah is written by God. God himself wrote Torah. So every word, every letter is <clears throat> very, very important. Very important. We see God is very exact in things that he does. <clears throat> Creates trillions and trillions of bugs and animals and people. And all of them have circulatory systems and respiratory systems and endocrine system, productive systems and everything. And there's a way that they work. So, that, you know, the vast majority of these animals, they all these systems work, so it's pretty amazing. So God does everything with tremendous precision. That's what we believe. That's what we believe. I mean, nobody saw him do it with precision, but that's what we believe. How much more so every word of the Torah is tremendously precise, and even more, the reason that God gave the Torah was to teach us what to do. The word Torah means to teach him. So it must be something that we can learn from these seemingly extra words and repetitions and you know, why does he write Shana so many times? Shana, a uh, hundred years, 20 years, seven, say 127 years, that's all. Mention years once, and then it repeats it again. The, the years of the life of Sarah. So let's see. First of all, we'll take Rashi. Rashi was Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki. <clears throat> and he, in a way, has been, been through the generations, he's been accepted as the main sort of basic, simple meaning of the Torah, explainer, explainer of the Torah. It says, Look, therefore, it says year in each one. It says, Mea shana, shana, shana. No more to say to you, that each one is learned on its own. And there's something special about being 100 years. Then there's something special about being 20. And then there's something special about being seven. So it didn't just say 127. It says 100 years and 20 years and seven years. When she was 100 years old, she was like 20 years old for sin. Now, according to the Torah, a person below, below 20 years old is not punishable in heaven for the sins that he does. Ma bat kav, just like she was 20 years old, she didn't sin. Shahari Eno Basonshin. He cannot be punished from heaven less than 20 years old. Also, Pas Kuf, also 100 years old. She was without sin. And Bas Kaf, Kabazayan Liyafi. And when she was 20, she was the same thing when she was seven.
for beauty. So it was really, it all came all together. She was seven years old. Her beauty <clears throat> was the same when she was 20. And also that beauty also carried on until she was 100. But when she was 100, it carried an additional thing is that she also, the, the year 20 signifies that that's the ending point <clears throat> for not being punishable. So that's where she was not punishable. She didn't do any sins. That's the years of Shenei Chayes. So why does it repeat it again? Because all of them were equal for good. So was, first of all, it tells you something about each and every detail that she had no sin and that she was beautiful. And finally it says, but as far as there was something that all of them were equal in, and namely that <clears throat> they were good. All of, her, all of her life was good. Good years. Which is a little bit hard to understand because what do you mean they were all good? It has to be understood because until she was 90 years old, she didn't have any children. She really wanted children. And she also had a lot of trouble from Hagar. In the beginning of her life, she was taken, <clears throat> she was taken prisoner by Paro and then again by Abimelech. So nevertheless, all of her years were good. The Rambam says exactly the opposite. He doesn't agree. He doesn't agree. Lashon Rashi, Rashi says that Shana Shana to tell you that all of them, each one is by itself, that she was 100, like 20 for sin, 20 for seven for beautiful, and also the same thing by the life of Avram. Anyway, he says, Ein Midrash Nechon. This is not right. Shnei Yishmael and Yishmael, it also says the same thing to Shnei Avram. Beshav that they're equal. Veloya Shavim Latova, but they weren't equal for good. Ella, but Yishmael is known that in the beginning he was evil, and afterwards he did tshuva. But Oda also, in Shana Shana, that what it says, each one, so that what it says, <clears throat> that they're equal, not necessarily, Yishmael has the same language as Abraham did, and Yishmael's life was not equal, in the beginning he was bad. Also, that what it says, Shana Shana, and we have, this implies that it's not <clears throat> learned out to make them equal. Shana, Shana, Vashanim, it says by Sora, Mea, <clears throat> sorry, Sora, Mea, Shana, Shana, and Shanim. Derech Alashan, this is just the way of speaking. It doesn't necessarily come to teach us something different from each one. Now, what it says in the Midrash, Embas Meashana, like 20 for sin. Lord Doshukin, Ella, Miyitur Lushan, Shechoser, Vomor, Shnei Chayasora. The reason that they learn in the Midrash, what Rashi does, is not from the extra words Shana. It's learned because this whole term is repeated again, Shnei Chayasora. <clears throat> so it equals all of them equally. And it doesn't say like Avram, and like it did with Avram. <clears throat> that Avram, it says that they were all equal, even though it doesn't have this extra Shnei Chaye Avram, it doesn't say afterwards. Okay, here's an interesting thing we have in the uh, Gomorrah. This is from Yalkut Shimoni. First of all, a little story it says Rebbe Akiva, when he was teaching, and if people were going to sleep because he was teaching pupils that they would like stay up all night and learn. When he would want to wake them all up, he would say, why was it that Esther ruled over 127 countries? That's what it says. That Esther ruled over 727, 20, 100 countries. Why 127? Tavo Esther, because Esther, that she was the daughter of the daughter of Sora, and Bo, <clears throat> that Sora, she was 127 years old. And Sora lived 127 years, as therefore <clears throat> Esther ruled over 127 countries. And this would wake everybody up, because it 
you know, what, what, what sense does it make? Why would, just because she lived 127 years, therefore she would get 127 countries. What's the connection? So it would wake everyone up. Okay. <clears throat> Here in Yalkut Shemoni, it learns a little bit differently. And it says like this. <clears throat> There's a sentence in Tilim, it says, God knows the days of the pure ones. <clears throat> it says, just like the tzaddikim are pure, so also their years are pure, are pure, complete. Like the tzaddikim are complete, so also their years are complete. And like it says, she was 20 years old, like seven for beauty. She was 100 years old, for, <clears throat> like she was for 20 for sin. Another explanation, if God knows the name of the Tamimim, this is Sora. That's what it says, Yemei Tamimim, that's Sora. This is like this, Shnei Shchaye Sora. It says the sun rises and the sun sets. What does it say? In, in, it's Mishli. The sun rises and the sun sets. It's in, um, I'm sorry, uh, in um, Kohelis. Don't we know that the sun raises and the sun sets? Don't we know that? Until one illuminary, namely one Sadiq, Dies as the another great tzaddik can't stand up. As soon as one tzaddik passes away, another one can stand up. But until then, the leader of the generation can't raise up. And now he's going to give a lot of examples. The day that Rabbi Akiva died, Rebbe was born, Rabbi, Rabbi Huda Nasi. <clears throat> Therefore, it says. The sun rises when the sun sets. The day that Rebbe died was born Rab Ada Bar Ahava. The day that Rab Ada Bar Ahava died was born Rab Abin. These are all Amoraim. The day that Rab Avin died was born Rab Ushia. The day that Rab Ushia was born, that was the day that <clears throat> Nola, the day that Rab Ushia, I'm sorry, passed away. It was born Rav Abba Hoshia, etc. Until it finally comes down and it says, the day that Moshe Rab, it says, Ajki, until Hashem uh, took away the power, set the son of Moshe, the, the son, the when Moshe's son sank, then Yoshua could shine. Like it says, Kach Yoshua bin Nun, until Yoshua, there couldn't come Ataniel ben Kanaz, that's already the judges, etc., 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 until finally it says, Hine Yaldam Milka, and then Chaye Sora. That's what it says. <clears throat> until the Sora passed away, or there couldn't shine. The son of Rivka. That's what it says, Yolda Milka Gani. And then it says, Shnei Chaye Sora. That's what it says, that Milka gave birth to Rivka. And then afterwards, Sora. So Sora, that's why it says, Yemei Chaye Sora, to tell us that the, when Sora's life finished, then could begin the real life of Rivka. Rivka, of course, became the wife of Yitzchak. Thomas Sora, Sora died in Kiryat Arba. This is Hebron, Eretz Canaan. And Avram came to, uh, to eulogize his wife and to weep for her. So he brings over here, usually people eulogize first. People, people cry first for a dead person. And then everyone's weeping. And then right before the person is buried, then you start to eulogize. So he brings over here with Sora, it was different though. <clears throat> Let's see, who said this? 
here. The Malbim. <clears throat> it says Surah died, even though that Avram was lived in Beersheba. <clears throat> but it happened to be that Sora, at the time she died, she was in Hebron for three reasons. Number one, it's Kiryat Arba. Kiryat Arba is going to be buried there. Four partners, Avram and his wife, Yitzchak and his wife, Yaakov and his wife, and Adam, first man, and his wife are buried there. Number two, it's Hebron. What does it mean, Hebron? Hebron means to join. The there is joined the spirit with the body, the upper world and the lower world. There's some people that say that after the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed, that all prayers nowadays go up through Hebron. Hebron, that's where the Avot are buried. The Eretz Canaan, <clears throat> in the land of Canaan, Hakadusha, Vraglua, the Bar Enosha people, Enan Arevimli, Shaba Lamut, Kedei Shetikaber Sham. It says in the land of Kadusha, it's a holy place, and people, Vraglua, and the accustomed people are Bar Nash, the people, Enan Arevimli. It's pleasure, it's a, it's a, a, a holy place to go to be buried. The Yavu Avram, Avram came from Beersheba to mourn for his wife and to cry for her. Usually, a Bechi who quote him as Hesped, usually crying comes before, this is the Malbim. Usually a person dies, everybody cries. And then afterwards, and then afterwards, before the person is buried, they eulogize the person or even after the person is buried. But that's with other people. That first of all, everybody gets emotional and they all cry because of the loss that's caused by when a person dies. But then afterwards, they get more intellectual and they make a hesped. But with Sora, it was the opposite. I saw her, the main thing was remembering the good things that she did and the lessons that she left behind and the completion that she had. And by means of this, everybody thinking, whoa, whoa, what we missed, what we have lost. But everybody felt there was a tremendous loss, but they couldn't really appreciate what it was. And when they started explaining it, then everyone started weeping. And that's what the Malvim says. <clears throat> Rashi says that he went to Kiryat Arba. This is Hebron. Kiryat Arba. Why is it called Kiryat Arba? Just call it Hebron. Kiryat Arba because there were four... <clears throat> Anakim Shayusham, because there were four giants that were there, Achiman, Shishai, Talmiv, and their fathers. And Drashachir, another explanation, because of the four Zugot, because of the four couples that were buried there. His a man and wife, Adam and Chava, Avram and Sora, Yitzchak and Rivka, and Yaakov and Leah. <clears throat> of course, there's a big question: why is Adam and Chava buried there? I thought this was the only place for Jews. Why Adam and Chava? We'll talk about that in just one moment. I'll explain it to you. There's a sikh about the Rebbe, and I'll explain. Avram came from Beersheba <clears throat> to weep for his wife and to cry for her. Was somehow or other she had separated from Abraham. She went to Hebron. He was in Beersheba. And when he heard that she died, he went over there. In the last week's Torah portion, we talked about the Akedah of Yitzchak. And now we're talking about how Sora died. That her husband, her son was supposed to be killed. But in the end, he was, and it was just a little, a sliver stood between him and death. As Parcha Nishmas, her soul jumped out of her body, from her, and she died. There's two ways of explaining this. Some people say that she died because she heard her son was almost killed. <clears throat> in other words, he was on the verge of death and she was so afraid that he would die. It was such a shocking thing to her. That her son was almost killed <clears throat> that she died. Another one is the exactly the opposite, that she was so shocked that her husband took her son to sacrifice and that her son was rejected, rejected. That God said, don't sacrifice your son. And that's what she thought that there was maybe something wrong with her son 
and he wasn't accepted as a sacrifice, and that's the reason why her soul jumped out of her body. Okay, however. Avram stood up from his dead wife, and he spoke to Bnei Chetz, and he said like this, Ger v'toshav anachim I am a temporary dweller here. I'm just passing through. I don't really live here. The Toshav, and I really do live here. Imochem. Tanu liachuz askever. Give me a place to bury my wife with you. And I'll bury my, give me a place, a grave, and I'll bury my dead body in front of Okay, first of all, Abraham had the whole world. You know, basically he could have buried her wherever he wanted to. But for some reason, he wanted to bury her there. So what was the reason? So obviously the reason was, is that that's what was called Beersheba. He knew that that's where Adam was born and that that's where he and Sora wanted to be born and buried. I'm sorry, he knows that was where Adam was buried and that's where he also wanted to be buried. He was, those would be the first two of the four couples. <clears throat> so in other words, he knew that Adam was buried and there's Midrashim over there that he knew. He saw a cloud that was over there and etc. Anyway, he realized that this was the place where Adam was buried and therefore he wanted his wife and himself to be buried there. So the Rebbe asked a very simple question. What does it mean, Ger v'toshiv? Uh, ger v'toshav? Abraham went to the people in Hebron and said, I am, a I'm just a passer through, I'm a gear. I'm just temporarily here. I don't really have any rights, but I'm also a toshav. I'm also permanent here. I have rights just like you do, maybe even more. Let's see what Rashi says. Rashi says, Ger v'toshav. He said, Ger, I come from another place. And now I've come to dwell with you. That's a simple meaning. I'm a gear. I, 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 I live in Beersheba, but now I came temporarily, Toshav, to be here with you. Toshav, I'm here to bury my wife. Medrash got another Medrash, listen to this. Im Tirzu, if you want to sell me the land to bury my wife, Gear. Then I'm a temporary resident. I have no rights here. Beam love, but if you don't want to sell me the land, then you should know that I will be a permanent dweller here. That and I will take the land from you legally. Like God said, I will give this land to you. God said the land belongs to me. Okay, so the Rebbe asked a simple question. The question is, I mean. Make up your mind. What, what, what is he? Abraham, is he really a temporary dweller? dweller? He's like a stranger. Ger is a stranger. Or a Toshav, or is he permanent, permanent uh, the citizen of the land? Abraham saying, I'm a permanent citizen. If you don't want to sell it to me, then I'll take it by force. I take it legally. So if so, what did he say I'm a Ger for? What did he say I'm, I'm not? I'm just passing through. Why? So the Rebbe says like this. Why did Abraham want to be buried there so much? Because that was where Adam was buried. What connection has Adam got to the Jewish people? Adam is the father of all mankind, right? And so the Rebbe says, no, not exactly. True, Adam is the father of all mankind, but that's sort of like, by the way, the, Adam was really created to be the first Jew. What's a Jew? A Jew is a person that he serves God. That's all he's interested in. A Jew is a person that all he's interested in is serving God and making God revealed in this world. That's a Jew. And that was Abraham. That was Adam. I'm sorry, that was Adam. Adam was created to make God revealed here in the world every second. Okay, he didn't do it, but nevertheless, that's what a Jew is. That's what a Jew is. A Jew. So therefore, Adam is buried there because at least for he was created really to be the first Jew. He was supposed to be, if Adam wouldn't have sinned from the tree, then everybody would be Jews. <clears throat> they would all have been relatives of Abraham. Maybe they would have sinned on their own, who knows, but they would, at least it wouldn't be because of him. So that's what Abraham was saying. Listen, you want to have a connection with, with Adam? You want to have a connection with Adam? Then you have to help me, because I'm a Jew. I'm doing the work what Adam was supposed to do. And if you help me, then you have a right to be in this world just like I do. In fact, even more, you were here before me. 
you were here in this place before me. Therefore, I'm just a temporary dweller. That's what he said. If you want to sell it to me, that I am just a temporary dweller. Why? Because your whole <clears throat> justification for being alive and existing is that you do what God wants. If you do what God wants and you sell me the land, then you've got a right to be alive just like I do, and you were here before me. So therefore, I'm just a temporary dweller. But if you don't want to sell me this land, and you don't want to help me, I, I, I'm a Jew, I'm connected to Abraham. You don't want to help me, then you have no connection to Abraham. <laughs> then you have no connection to Adam, I'm sorry. Then you have no connection even to Adam. Abraham said, I am, I'm the representative of Adam in this world. I'm coming to make a whole, a whole new generation of people, the Jews, that they are going to serve God every minute of their lives, just like Adam was supposed to do. If you want to help me out, then you have as much connection to Abraham, a next connection to Adam as I do. But if you don't want to help me out, then it's not just you don't have a connection to me. You don't even have a connection to Adam. You're not even here. Therefore, that means that I'm the only one that's really here. Then the land belongs to me. So if you want to help me, then that means you have a connection to the first man, Adam. You don't want to help me, means you have no really existence. You have no connection even to Adam. He says, and therefore, he said, Ger v'toshav. I am a Ger v'toshav. Therefore, the Rebbe explains a very interesting thing, by the way, in the Sicha. He explains that that's why a non-Jew, according to the law, a non-Jew that transgresses one of the seven Noah commandments, the punishment officially is death. He says, why? That's a, uh, is that a, isn't that a severe punishment? He says, no, the idea is, is that if he doesn't want to do the seven Noah commandments, he steals, he kills, whatever, then it means that he's not connected to Adam. He's not connected to, 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 to any, he has no justification for being alive. So therefore, a connection to God, whether it's the non-Jews and the seven Noahide commandments, or it's the Jews, this gives a justification for life. And if not, it cuts off the, the, the justification of life. The Jews are a little bit different, though, because at Mount Sinai, so Mount Sinai, God made a bris with the Jewish people, that he would never cut them off. So no matter what a Jew does, he's always got a connection to God. That's one of the big differences between the Jews and the non-Jews. Okay, we'll stop here and we'll, we'll continue with the Shulchan Aruch. Laws of Shabbat. <clears throat> we did this. We did this also, but we'll do this one again. If a sick person says, I need such and such a, a medicine. I need penicillin. But Rofa Omar Ainsar, he says, you don't need that. You listen to the sick person. The heart knows the bitterness of the soul. Right? The doctor says, have you ever taken this before? Yes, I did, and it helped me once. He says, listen, it's not going to do anything. Doesn't make any difference. If he wants it, then he take. Then he he is. This is talking about about a sick person. That's his whole body is sick. But if the doctor says that if you take that, it's going to hurt you, then we listen to the doctor. This is what we were doing last time. This is where we were. We did this last time, but we can do it again. Should, uh, if you have to defile Shabbos, should it be done through a non-Jew or through a Jew? And here he's going to say that it should be done through a, even though we said in the beginning by a Jew, here he's going to say it should be done by a non-Jew. 
Better to do by an Anju. And let's learn the whole law. We'll see. <clears throat> okay, first of all, we did this, so I'll do it a little, I'll do it quickly. A sick person that's in danger, that they said, they, they call the doctor on Shabbos. The doctor comes on Shabbos, and the doctor says, this man needs an eight-day treatment. You have to take a shot. Eight days. Now on Shabbos, if it's not a life-threatening disease, you're not allowed to take a shot because it's drawing blood. This doctor says you have to take a series of eight-day shots. You have to give him a shot eight days in a row. We don't say, hey, let's wait until Motzi Shabbos, and then we'll start the process. So it'll come out that we're only just going to be transgressing one Shabbos. Right? It'll start on Motzi Shabbos, and it'll end the next Motzi Shabbos. So next Shabbos, we'll transgress the Shabbos because of the sick person. But if we start today, it'll be eight. So we don't say that. But we start the treatment immediately. Even though that we have to transgress two Shabbos, even though we know that he will not die today, if we don't start doing this thing today, I mean, the doctor's already told him that the treatment is eight days, so obviously the doctors think he's going to live eight days. <clears throat> Shahari al Omdu, they said he's going to live for eight days, the doctor said. So, if so, let's push it off and start treating him after Shabbat. No, you should worry that maybe if you push it off for one day, then maybe he'll die. Maybe it won't work. Maybe the treatment won't work so well, and he'll die after eight days. They should do it immediately. But if it's possible to do immediately without transgressing the Shabbos, all you have to do is wait. Let's say it's nearing the end of Shabbat. You ask the doctor, should we do it immediately? The doctor says, yes, you should start giving the shot immediately. Can we wait an hour? So an hour? Of course you can wait an hour. I meant that, you know, don't wait until tomorrow. So if you can wait an hour, then don't transgress the Shabbat in order to do it immediately, without any delay. If it's in such a way that there's no danger whatsoever if you wait this hour or whatever. Why? Because Shabbos, if a person is sick, it does not negate the Shabbat. It just pushes away the Shabbat for whatever this person needs. Shabbat dechuya. Shabbat is only pushed away because of pikuach nefesh, and it's not, the Shabbat is not released totally. Legamri. We don't say, oh, grandpa is sick. For grandpa, there's no more Shabbos. You can do anything that grandpa wants. Right? No more Shabbos. We don't say that. We say that Shabbat is pushed away for everything that's necessary for his healing, even for a far away, far away reason, right? He says, I feel better if I turn on the lights. But if he doesn't feel good, and maybe he'll get scared, he'll die early. The call Shev Silu, but all that it's possible to save him without transgressing the Shabbos. So therefore the Shabbos is not pushed away for him. Right? So in other words, anything that might, if you do it, might save his life, even the farthest away, as you can do it. If he says, Listen, I want a cigarette, right? You say a cigarette. Why a cigarette? Says, I don't know, you know, calm me down. So you have to think about it. You know, if having a cigarette will really calm him down, will this really, will, maybe it'll really help to save him a little bit? If so, then you can give him a cigarette. But if not, you can't give him a cigarette for no reason. Just because he happens to be sick, he's dying. So therefore, there's no Shabbat for him. Because we saw the Shabbat is, is just pushed away. It is not negated. You call him a if there is before us goyim, or children, that they aren't mitzvahs. Now, if a child does something on Shabbat, it's not forbidden. 
or of a goy for sure is not forbidden. A child, you have the point of education. You have to educate children. So you're not supposed to ed- ed- encourage children to do something that might be a sin when they get older. But uh, <clears throat> a non-Jew, for sure you can tell them, right? This is, well, this is a little bit of a problem. A non-Jew, you're not allowed to tell a non-Jew to do work for you on Shabbat. It's forbidden from the rabbis. You're not allowed to tell a non-Jew to do work for you on the Shabbat. But if the person is sick, then that pushes away this rabbinical prohibition. So if therefore, if there is a non-Jew there, we don't say it's possible to do by means of these people. Do, you know what? Let a non-Jew do it and don't call Shabbos by means of a Jew. Why? Because since that it's not the way to save a person only by doing a forbidden thing on Shabbat, therefore, nidcha Shabbat bishvilo, therefore the Shabbat is pushed away. If the only way to save grandpa is by giving him a shot, so it doesn't make any difference if I give him the shot or if a non-Jew gives him the shot. It is permissible for me to give him the shot. There's no transgression there at all. So therefore, if grandpa needs a shot on Shabbat, then there's no reason to tell a non-Jew to do it. Because if I do it, I'm not transgressing anything myself. Shabbat is pushed away from him. <clears throat> if so, there's no transgression at all by doing these things. Not only that, even if a Jew says, no, I don't want to give grandpa a shot because it's forbidden for the, from the Torah if grandpa wasn't sick. So therefore, I'm going to have a non-Jew do it. So listen, not a good idea. I feel if you want to be a religious Jew and you want to be so you're super religious and you're not going to defile the Shabbos even for your sick grandfather. You but which is what do you mean? I'm I'm doing it by means of a non-Jew. What's the problem? I'm not endangering him. Or katan or machmashein or rotzeli troach or maybe he doesn't want to take the trouble on his own. Maybe we can say that it's forbidden. Right? And grandpa has to go to the hospital. Why should I drive him to the hospital? <clears throat> it's a long time. I'm going to have to waste my whole Shabbos. It's a big doubt if I can come back. Right? I can't, if I, without grandpa, for sure I can't come back. And even if he gets better, right, can I bring him back? It's going to save his life. And why should I get stuck there? I'll tell the Nanji to take my car. And he'll take him there. Says, that's a good idea, but it could be that it's forbidden. Why? It's forbidden from the rabbis. Shema maybe then people will see Maybe people, my next door neighbor, he doesn't know so much learning Torah. His grandfather will get sick and he'll say, oh, I saw Rabbi Bolton that he, his grandfather was sick and he had him taken to the hospital by means of, of a non-Jew. So I'm only going to do it by a non-Jew and he runs to my house says, tell me, is you got your non-Jew? Can I take this? No, he's not working here today. He's not working by me today. I gave him, I gave him a week off. He says, um, what am I going to find the non-Jew? What do you need a non-Jew for? I haven't got any time. He runs away. So what's going to be, he's going to think, people will think that if someone's in danger, you have to do it by means of a non-Jew. You know, I saw the rabbi do it. V'shem yavu adabar lo. Yimsu nachri and maybe will come if you don't find the non-Jew or you don't find the child, then I'll say, I don't want a machal Shabbos by, by, I'll leave by, by, by a, a person that's me that I'm obligated to miss I don't want to do it. So what's going to be? If I try to find the non-Jew, then other people are going to say, if someone is sick, dying, you can't Heal him yourself. You have to find the non-Jew. And there's not a non-Jew. And really, that's untrue. It's not true. The only reason I was looking for a non-Jew was just because it made no difference whether me or a non-Jew. But the other people don't know it makes no difference. Other people think that it does make a difference and you have to find a non-Jew. I feel about Nashim, even women, shame of us, but they are obligated in their commandments. And they haven't got this worry. What I can say, uh, instead of me doing it, I'll have my wife do it. My wife will 
Nevertheless, right, why should I do it? I'll have my wife, she'll take him to the hospital. Says, oh, this, this is good, right? Uh, you, they're Jews. Nevertheless, there's an, an, another reason why not <clears throat> to let women do the work in the place of men. <clears throat> Grandpa is sick, it's better not to have a woman give him a shot. Why? Ain't Muslim lem levada, masuk bepikuach. Bepikuach is that you don't let them <clears throat> do this work. Shiyasu al yadam, this should be done by them. Because why? Maybe they'll be a little bit lazy. Or yifshu'ubo. Or maybe they will be negligent. Women. Avo mitztarfim in Yisrael, or mosrim adabar Yisrael, but you can do a Jew a male with a female. And the women can help also by means of a Jew, by means of a man. Shekiv and Yisrael also, but since there's a male there, Avim is the resident, she'll also be careful and work hard. She won't take it easy. And Mikolmukom, nevertheless, it's a mitzvah move. The best thing is, is that everything should be done by means of Jews. G'dolim b'chachma. Wise Jews. The lawyer the Hediot says not even simple Jews and or women. Why? So that everyone will see that. Wow, this is really a good thing to save a person's life on Shabbat. And we see he doesn't even want to give it to the women to do. Why was the rabbi doing it himself? It must be that Shabbos is very precious by him, but life is even more precious. Shalote Shabbos Kala Benim, so that Shabbos won't be like a light thing in the eyes of the women or a simple person. And then the women or the simple people, they'll say, I guess Shabbos is not such a big deal. After all, I mean, he lets us break the Shabbos every every Sunday and, you know, I mean, every, every uh, Shabbos comes up, everyone who gets sick, the rabbi tells us to do it, right? And also this tells everybody that it is permissible and a mitzvah to Mechal Shabbos for a person that is at any danger of death. My, my wife's parents told me they came here from Iraq. It came a long time ago. They got married here and they were living in some sort of a town. These were like, you know, very simple Jews and they kept Shabbat according to what they knew and even did the commandments, you know, but but they didn't really know that much. They weren't really, and they didn't have any rabbis <clears throat> that came with them. <clears throat> I guess they didn't want to live in a city, anyway, whatever the reason was. <clears throat> they said there came a rabbi to the village where they learned, lived the area where they were living, I don't remember what it was. <clears throat> there came a rabbi, an, an Ashkenazic rabbi. Now in the beginning, the Ashkenazic, I mean, maybe, anyway, they considered themselves to be s- superior to the Sephardic Jews. A big sickness, but that's what it is. So he got there, and my, uh, it was cold. One Shabbat, there was a knock on the door, and the rabbi's son was there. He said he wants to talk to Mr. Pinchas. That was my my wife's father. So he came over, and the rabbi said, "Listen, uh, it's really cold. I have to have somebody light light my the fire." That's what they told me the story. I have to have somebody light the fire of my uh, oven on Shabbat. So so he said, "A rabbi, a rabbi is telling me to do it. It must be okay." So he lit the fire, <laughs> lit the fire. <clears throat> And then after that, so he talked to somebody and somebody said, it doesn't seem right to me. I, I think you must have made up the story. A rabbi wouldn't say to do that. So it happened another time that it was cold and I guess his fire went out or something. And he called my wife's father to light the fire from him. He was a simple Jew, you know, <clears throat> and he didn't know the laws anyway. So he did it a second time. But finally, the third time when he did it, so my wife, my wife's mother, on the other hand, she was a real you know, a, a very, uh, how do you say, a, a powerful person. Powerful. She had a really, when something was wrong, oh, she would really give it to him. So the first time she figured it was okay, the rabbi said, you know, and the second time she didn't figure out what, she said, that's it. Was not gonna, the third time she started screaming at him and yelling at him. She went to the rabbinut in wherever it was Tel Aviv and they got him fired. They got this rabbi fired. 
<laughs> but just saying that it's better not to do things by means of simple Jews, because if you do that, then they think that, you know, hey, also oh, Shabbos is not a big deal. I can turn on the lights if I want to. It's not such a big thing. Maybe big rabbis, they can't do it. They don't do it because they're rabbis, you know. Uh, but uh, I mean, simple people, it's okay. So therefore, it says it's better to do things by a Jew. A Jew should do it. <clears throat> First opinion. Second opinion is the exact opposite. Some people say that since the Shabbat is just pushed away and it's not totally removed. So therefore, what do we see? That grandpa is sick, right? So grandpa says, turn on the lights. Uh, I feel if he's, he's it's, if it's a, a sickness <clears throat> that endangers his life, and he says, turn on the lights, you can turn on the lights for him. If he says, okay, you know, heat up some water for me. I have to have some water to drink. You can heat up water for him. And if he says, turn on the television, I want to watch the uh, the World Series, that you can't do. They can't do. It's, it's got nothing to do with his health or with his life. He says, light me up a cigarette. Right? I want to smoke a cigarette. A, a cigarette's going to save his life? No. In other words, Shabbat is just pushed away for the things that he needs, but you still have to keep the Shabbat. So some people say, oh, if you have to keep, we see that you have to keep the Shabbat for a sick person, you still, Shabbat still applies to him. So therefore they say, and that which you can do, so that there will not be any transgression from the Torah you have to do. So there should not be doing any forbidden work on Shabbat, even though it's permissible for him, but it's not 100% permissible. It's just pushed away. Therefore, if it's possible to do it by without any delay and without any waiting by, by means of a change on something unusual, then you should do it by means of a shinui. You can give him an injection with your teeth, hold it between your toes. Then there won't be any Isser Shabbos in the Torah. According to the Torah, things have to be done in a normal way. If they're not done in a normal way, then it could be that it won't be forbidden from the Torah. Therefore, we say that if it's possible to do it by means of a Nanju without any delay at all, then you have to do it by means of a Nanju. And you have to do it, these people say, from the Torah, you have to do it by Nanju. And when did they say you should not do it by means of a Nanju? only in a place where there is to worry that maybe the Nanju won't do a good job and it'll come to delay. But if you know that the Nanju will not delay, especially if the Jew is standing over the Nanju and washing him, so then you don't have to worry. Okay, so what's the law? Should we go according to the first opinion and do everything by ourselves? to show a good example, to show everyone how important it is to the Jewish life, or maybe not. Maybe we should try as much as possible not to defile the Shabbat. It says, the main thing is like the first opinion, that a Jew should do it. Nevertheless, the custom in all of our countries is like the last opinion. Find the non-Jew. If it's possible, find the non-Jew. Oh, we'll talk Shaloi and Hoko, but it's good not to do this way like everybody does. Because there's a worry. Shem Yiru Achshav, maybe you'll see that you don't do, you're not saving a life of a Jew only by means of a non-Jew. And people will think that there's an issue. People will think maybe it's forbidden to save a Jew's life by means of a Jew. <clears throat> it's Aser B'zele Olam Al Yudei Yisrael. And sometimes, maybe there won't be a Jew. And by means of this, you'll bring a danger to the sick person. But in this, which you wait, delay, <clears throat> until you wait for the non Jew. So, so, what's he say? The main thing is a Jew should do it, but the custom is, is they don't. Says the Rebbe, I think it's a bad idea. 
you should do it by means of a Jew. Nevertheless, if you do want to do it by means of a non-Jew, you should tell everybody that it's permissible for a Jew to do it, but it just happens to be that there's a non-Jew here. But if there was no non-Jew, I would do it on my own. Okay. Next law. <clears throat> the quicker you are to transgress the Shabbat when there is a, a life in danger, the better it is. Even if it means that you have to fix something else up in order to do it. For instance, you spread a, nut, a net for someone, a child that fell into the river. And by means of that, you've also trapped fish, which is forbidden. And all other things similar like that, don't worry about it. Saving a life, the faster, the quicker, the better. <clears throat> if a child is closed in a house, you can break the door open and take him out because maybe the child will be so afraid that, he's, that he'll die. If there was a sick person, excuse me, I'm just taking off my shirt, my shirt, my uh, jacket. Ah, excuse me. If there was a sick person, that's in danger, the danger of his life. And he needs meat. Four o'clock. Okay, this is the last law then. Very good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let's see if I did I erase it. Hope not. Yes, I did. Okay, going back to the law. This is because it's a very nice law. Let's just get this one. I'm sorry that I erased the whole thing. Here we go. Here we go. All right, it just didn't take us very long. Where were we then? We were on. Yud Kimmel. There's two more. Okay. Here we go. If there was a, a person that was sick and the doctor said, he has to have fresh meat. We can take an animal and shech the animal. Forbidden to shech on Shabbos, but we're saving a person's life. And we don't say, you know what, let's get a goy to shech for him. And then he'll eat. Then I won't do a sin. And he'll be doing a sin. Shehi is her love. But the sin of transgressing Shabbos is very bad. And it's punishable by death. I'll get a non-Jew to set a slaughter for him, and then he'll eat what's called nevela. And that's only a sin that's punishable by lashes. And of course, he won't get lashes because he can do anything he wants to to save his life. It's better to get have a non-Jew shech the meat, and I won't mechal Shabbos, which is a forbidden, which is a punishable by skila, because Shabbos was given to push away Kamo have Arab Bishal because Shabbos was given to push away by already that you can boil, you can light a fire and boil. And also on the Vela, you only transgress on every single Kazayas 
even when he eats a little bit of a kazayas, right? Even when he eats a little bit of a kazayas, <clears throat> there's an iser from the Torah in every single bite that he takes. So what's going on? When, if I shecht a <clears throat> chicken for my father and I cook it and I eat it, right? I, I, I light a fire and I cook it. So then I'm doing three sins. I'm shechting from the Torah. I'm transgressing Shabbos by shechting, by lighting a fire and by cooking. If I have a non-Jew and the non-Jew shechts it, so then we, that I've taken away one sin from myself. I, I've put a, I'm still doing two sins. I have to light the fire and I have to cook. But okay, there's one sin less. Not only that, grandpa, he's gonna eat the meat He's going to do only a sin that's punishable by lashes. And of course, he won't get lashes because he's, he's sick. He's able to. So he says, <clears throat> yeah, it, when I do shechita, I only do one, even though it's chamor. So he says, nevertheless, there's something wrong with this. If I let a goy shecht, then every bite that grandpa takes He's doing a sin from the Torah. True, it's not as, as, as severe a sin, but he's still doing a lot of sins. Every time he eats a kazayas, he's doing a sin, which is not the case if I slaughter the animal and only, only doing one sin. Oh, it also, maybe grandpa, he'll be disgusted to eat forbidden food. And the whole entire purpose, oh, I, didn't, I was supposed to share this. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Are you with me? Am I with you? What's happening over here? What happened? What happened? Return to meeting. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. <sighs> this doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> I have to figure out how this thing works some other time. Let me just let me just go back to the law. Okay. Which is not the case if I shecht. If I have a goy shech the chicken, so true, I don't do that sin on Shabbat. But on the other hand, grandpa, every bite he takes, he's going to be doing a sin, a lesser sin, true. But another thing is, is that maybe he's not going to want to eat at all. I don't want to eat in the vela. So therefore, if, therefore, if the sick person immediately needs food and not kosher meat is there and shechting it will take time, Therefore, we say we give him not kosher food to eat. We'll talk about this more, God willing, tomorrow. Thank you for coming.